Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of My Sunderland 11. If you are new to the channel and you do like what you see, please do subscribe, that is very much appreciated. As always, we are in association with the Sunderland Food Bank, so all the details on how you can donate to a, a very good cause uh, in the city of Sunderland at the moment, all the links are in the de uh, description below. Uh, with me, I've got a very, very, very special guest. He is uh, one of the hosts of the Wise Men Say podcast, Rory Fallow. How are you? Very good, mate. Yeah, thanks, Matthew. Thanks for having us on. Yeah, no, 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 no problem whatsoever. Um, just like, how are you really uh, during this like lockdown? Um, yeah, this third one's kind of been the 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 worst one yet, I guess, hasn't it? Like the yeah. first one, I guess we had a bit of novelty for want of a better word to it, and you know everyone was doing five k challenges or bacon banana bread, and I think we're all just a bit. <laughs> A bit sick now, aren't we? Well, we had nice weather then as well. Now it's freezing cold and dark at four o'clock. But I guess at least, I was going to say at least we've got football now to watch. But after yet another draw, 2-2, two -two, last minute equaliser against Gillingham, it's, um, that, that one's maybe a little bit questionable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it certainly it is a little bit. But say so more about you really. So you, you're part of the Wise Men Say podcast and have been for quite a while. How, how, do, you, how do you find that? Uh, yeah, it's great fun. Um, I got involved um, back in in 2015, um, late in 2015. It was just after uh, after Sam Allardyce had came in, and the podcast itself, Gareth and Stephen started it in in 2013. Um, and obviously they they host the the Monday show and now myself and Matthew Keelan host the the Thursday show and we tend to do the reaction pods as well. So we kind of cover. Um, we always say like the range of what you go through as a fan in the week because the reaction pod you're all well tend to be absolutely fuming or despondent after another crap result monday you kind of you rationalized it a little bit and, and you're sort of like trying to put together you're still a bit annoyed but you're trying to put together maybe how we can get out of the situation and then by thursday the match is nearly back again so you're optimistic and you're talking about how you're going to turn over whatever league one job as it is four nil and then you eventually draw one one and you know the cycle sort of repeats itself yeah no i think i think it's fantastic because it's almost like an instant reaction like i uh, the match finishes and about an hour later you've already got the sort of reaction podcast up um but like how um obviously w w watching the games and, and listen i think it does sort of lift lift everyone's mood a little bit when you listen to it because i think it is so like humorous and you all get on really well when you when you talk on that yeah i think that's like an important thing with us we all do we've all been doing the pod a lot of us met through the pod but we've all been doing it for quite a while now and, and we see each other like socially as well so like for example we did like we would usually go out at christmas but instead like our christmas was obviously virtual this year so we did like a big quiz for that and all got involved and like, we do like go out for drinks together and like you know the reaction pod itself is usually in a pub like myself and matthew live like <laughs> embarrassingly close to each other to be honest um but yeah so that sort of natural sort of conversation we have does kind of come onto the pod <clears throat> Which really helps, I think. It means we don't sound very, very forced or anything yeah. like that. And it means stupid little inside jokes like calling players just a man have ended up creeping yeah. their way onto the pod, which then makes it a bit weird when you see like people tweeting that so and so player is just a man. But that that's yeah. I think what makes us like I think that's a bit of a unique sort of selling yeah. point, so to speak, with us. Yeah, no, I think I think that's fantastic. Yeah, that's that's a joke I do I do find quite funny. The the sort of just a man thing. That's how I sort of uh, imagine the podcast. It's very good, but a lot of what you do, you react you're reacting to the games, and obviously how we're watching the games this season is very different. So, how do you find like what watching the games this season compared to actually being at the stadium? Yeah, that's like that is an interesting thing, especially with the pods themselves, because well, like what I was just saying, those reaction pods. They, we usually do them in a pub and you've usually got like a bit of like background noise to that as well. And it's kind of part of your match day routine. And and that's kind of the thing that, that I'm missing the most. I know, I know it's a bit of a cliche, but you spot a team like Sunderland, it's usually quite, the, the stuff on the pitch is usually quite disappointing, but the stuff before and after is, is what makes it. Like we've all got our individual match day routines, like the pubs we go to before and after, who we go to the games with as well. Like, like I, at home games i sit with my parents so that could be the only time i see them that week do you know what i mean and then like we'll yeah. go for a pint before and then 
afterwards tend to go out with friends and stuff like that and it, and it's just seeing those like random people as well like the the person that sits next to you whose name you don't know but you you know what his job is or you know how many like grandkids he's got and stuff like that these like relationships you build up or the people that you see at away games and you're on sort of like nodding terms with that kind of thing so it, it's all that like sillier social side that, that I miss um and it obviously does make the games less intense as well doesn't it no crowds being there I think even in the Premier League while it's like technically still well feels like a different sport to the team we watch sometimes but I think it is having a, a sort of an impact on on the intensity of, of some matches like how many brilliant games can you think of over since like football restarted um you know maybe the Champions League had some exceptions to that but you know it does, it does take a lot away when you don't have that crowd sort of reaction doesn't it yeah I, I i completely agree i think it where i where i see it uh coming into effect the most really is that when you're sort of um <clears throat> last five minutes in the game if you really need to push on to get like an equalizer or a winner where the crowd would usually be be you know getting those players up for the yeah. up for it really and then you just sort of see them now and passing sideways and backwards and we're getting them it's infuriating to watch really because you just like you want to be in the stadium and just scream at those players to yeah get the ball, totally forwards and well, yeah. you know, the thing that we're going through at the minute with our home form being quite poor, the sort of odd silver line under that is it dispels this myth that, you know, we're too expectant and it's, it's the fans' fault when Sunderland are struggling and we like hound managers out and stuff because we're not there and we're struggling. And there's quite a few times this season where we've been, you know, not being able to maybe quite get that second goal to see a game out or it has been 1 1. and. I think the fans are a massive lift for for many of the players. There is quite a few, you know, look at Grant Ledbetter, for example, or or Max Power, those type of players do. Chris Chris Maguire, I know he's not in the squad at the minute, but there's another good example of someone who loves playing to that big crowd. And for a lot of the players in our squad now, for all that a lot of them aren't the best, this is going to be probably the biggest club they ever play for. Like, not as a dig on on this player, but Tom Flanagan, for example, is he going to play for a club again with that kind of stadium who can get like thirty, forty thousand in? Probably not. So he's mm-hmm. probably going to be relishing having them in, even though he's not like the best player in the world. So I think if you ask the players individually, they'd probably be missing having us there beyond the sort of usual cliches and platitudes that they have to speak. But I think we would be giving them a bit of a much needed lift at the moment. Yeah, I think as well, it also works the other way. I think maybe for some players, it has helped them. I think Charlie White, for example, maybe having no fans in the stadium may may have helped him, you know, where I think yeah, the pressure might, bit. Yeah, pressure might get a bit too much. But then it comes to people like, you know, Will Grigg, where it literally just doesn't change. He's still the exact same <laughs> player. <laughs> yeah, very true. But yeah, I, I think we would all rather be in the stadium. Absolutely. And I think it's just that... Uh, the match day routine you know wake up in the morning you look forward you look forward to going it's the whole day it's not just the football match it's the whole day of socializing it's it's something we really miss and hopefully we get back soon yeah completely so really my next question really is uh what does Sunderland AFC mean to you if that isn't a difficult question um I think like to me it is a a community thing it's it's an institution like Sunderland is a city that you know since the sort of decline of industry really of, of you know the, sh- the shipyards and, and and the pits and stuff like that there's been a lot that's been taken away from Sunderland and the club is is something that we still have and we can still isn't just something that we can look back on as being part of our past it's, it's still very much part of our present as well and you know hopefully will be part of our future unless we end up getting relegated to the National League um, but it, it, it's that for me and it's and it's the it is the supporters as well, the the amazing fan base that we have. That's part of the character of the club, I guess. It is, you know, everyone will say it, it's more than just a football club. But I think with Sunderland, it's it's very applicable. Like, I, I live in the city, I, I live in Rogue End. I'm, I'm not saying this is a dig, but the busiest I have, have ever seen Sunderland City Centre is on match days or after matches when, say, we've you know, beating Newcastle or, or we've stayed up, you know. I remember after the, the first 3-0 um, when Paolo Di Canio was manager, the town that day was like New Year's Eve, Christmas Eve, you know, Mardi Gras, like all sort of like rolled into one. And, you know, that it's a shame we don't get that more often, but it, 
it lifts the city. The city feels better, and you know, I bet economically the city must do better when when the club's doing well. Because you know, you think after after a good win, you'll think, oh yeah, we'll, we'll we'll go out for a couple of beers, and a couple turns into three or four, and, and it just lifts the mood of everyone. And with us being a one club city as well, and with us being in a part of the country where there isn't really much choice. There's there's us, there's Newcastle, there's Middlesbrough, and then, you know, you go a bit lower down and there's like Hartlepool and Darlington and stuff. So it's not like we're in the Northwest where it's a lot more concentrated. You do have a lot more choice, not just in terms of like your huge clubs like United, City, Liverpool, Everton, whatever. The, the likes of Blackburn, Wigan, Preston, Burnley, they're all in a short space of each other. All clubs who, you know, are in those top two divisions, whereas in the Northeast... There's that little bit more, little bit more isolated that gives you that little bit more pride to it as well. And, and Sunderland's a really, really good example of that because, you know, in the northeast we are sort of kind of the underdog as well, aren't we? Like I think that's I think that's in the in the supporters as well. You know, the the, the rivalry with Newcastle isn't just about football. It's about the fact that you know they don't get the investment that Sunderland does and and they kind of like look down their noses at us as well so there's this good underdog sort of spirit to Sunderland as well which I think is why we you know we like players like Lee Catamore and Kevin Ball who are like really combative and really you know run themselves into the ground there's a few of those players in the 11 who don't really fit that bill um but but some of them who very much do so yeah I think that's kind of kind of sums up what the the club means to me it's 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 a people thing and, and sort of the character of the of the city as much as anything yeah and no, I completely agree with you and I think I see that I see that um I see the difference between where I live because obviously as you can tell I live I live like near London I live in Essex and I think when I go to Sunderland it's the way I describe it is like two different worlds it's just completely different there because I feel I feel a bit more of a sense of community there where I think mm. everyone down here is sort of all about themselves and in, in a way you know where people are down here and there's a lot of businesses going uh, and everyone's all about themselves really but there it's about everyone else and I, I find mm. that really really nice and yeah I completely agree you do make a very good point and um, obviously things aren't very good now but uh, we have actually had a uh, quite a positive history as I, I, I like to remind people as well and this is what this series is all about sort of reminisce over your favorite uh, starting 11 so your one is I, I have to say quite interesting you <laughs> There's a few interesting choices from you there, but I guess it makes it a lot more interesting. So I think we'll start with your goalkeeper. So who have you got in goal? Yeah, with with this, I didn't want to go like too stereotypical. So it's it's not going to be Niall Quinn and Kevin Phillips up front, and and obviously it's got to be players. I think I think with this, it's got to be players who you saw play as well. You can't you know can't be picking like Rich Carter and people like that. Yeah, of course. but goalkeepers were actually quite spoiled for choice. With if you think you know recently, John Pickford, Vito Minone, Simon Mignolet, Craig Gordon, like we had this like ten year period kind of interrupted by the likes of Lee Camp and Jason Steele and, you know, maybe actually the two goalkeepers we've got now. But yeah. I've gone for one who I think's a little bit forgotten because of the good goalkeepers that, that came after him. And and that's Mark Poon. Um, we, he, was, he was excellent for us. And we got rid of him and, and Thomas Myron brought in Kelvin Davis, which was a big disaster. But I'll be honest, the main reason, well, there's two reasons I, I've included him. And one is the obvious one. That header against Derby County, like, that was, I, I, like obviously a goalkeeper scoring is fantastic, and will always be like sort of remembered. But I don't think it gets like acknowledged how good of a header that was. Like yeah. the way he jumps to that header is absolutely phenomenal, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, no, it was. And do you know what? I I saw a stat earlier on today. If Danny Graham starts like a few more games for Sunderland, Mark Poon would have had a better goals to game ratio than Danny Graham. Yes, I think, uh, <laughs> I think Mickey so Roth of, 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 of Wise Men Say Parish um, tweeted that actually, and yeah. yeah, that is phenomenal. But you know, he had a good career. I think he, I think he went to Arsenal after after he's with us, and he's a bit of a legend at, at Derby County where he was before. Who he obviously scored against, but he was, you know, your proper. He's in that Peter Schmeichel mode, wasn't he? Where he was really like commanding. He got off his line well. Obviously, a great shot stopper. And but I'm saying he's a great shot stopper. I have actually scored a goal past Mark Poom, which was really? on Boxing Day 2003 
when I was mascot when we beat uh, Bradford City at home. So obviously you got to take a shot at the goalkeeper just before kickoff, and I buried one in the bottom corner at the north stand. So you can have all those honours and score that goal if he wants, but he will have to live with the fact that ten-year-old me did uh, bury the ball past him, uh, right? Rather convincingly, I'm going to say as well. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. I've got the chance to be a mascot as well, and that was a uh, yeah, a fantastic, oh, really? yeah, fantastic experience. Yeah. So yeah, that, that that's great. Um, yeah, we'll move on now to your uh, your full back. So we'll start with uh, your right back. So right back, this is this is a bit one of. To be honest, I think I think my back four. <laughs> I am going to have to accept there's going to be goals being leaked here. But I've gone for Maybe. Billy Jones at right back because a lot of the criteria for players that I've picked is is just did they give me joy, and that could be like through them being good, or that could just be for them being quite funny. And Billy Jones for a start. Like, can you remember when he signed and like the pictures and like holding up a scarf were just utterly hilarious? Like, yeah, he had his big daft long hair and it's just like his name and his hair and, and everything about him. Like, I know he got that cut eventually, but he looked like he'd just been transported in from about 1975. <laughs> like, he looked like a man out yeah. of time, and I was just like, I'm gonna like this guy. He was meant to replace Phil Bardsley. Can you believe that? I can't, honestly. We're trying to replace Phil Bardsley, aren't we? <laughs> trying. Yeah, yeah, we are. But then again, Billy Jones has scored against the Mags. So I think well, that is that is another reason why he's in as well because yeah. of that run of, of six in a row. Obviously, we got some heroes out of that, like like Fabio Barini being being a good one because like laughing at Tim Cruel scoring that great goal home. Jermaine Defoe with the volley and Stephen Fletcher actually as, as well always played well against him. Got a couple of goals, but that, that Billy Jones even scored against him. And I know it was a tapping, but it's like. Billy Jones scoring against you is really yeah. funny. He also as well with Billy Jones, and like I'm sure I've not like imagined this. He nearly scored one of the best goals I've ever seen for Sunderland. He played Stoke away. It was under it was under Dick Advocat when he came in for that original just until the end of the season. Like a one-one draw, like Connor Wickham, I think, scored for us after about a minute. And they equalized that the game finished one-one. But in the second half, he went on this like amazing run where he was like dribbling past people, playing one twos, and he got like pretty much clean through one on one, dead center. And it would have been this amazing goal because of like the run he went on, and then he just put it wide. <laughs> and I was just like, that's that is what sums him up. Like he's just because he was never like that great for us, really, was he? But he was never like absolutely terrible. He was actually exemplified by his name he was a bit of a just a man for us which yeah. again makes me quite like him and then you know you factor in the, the funny hair the goal against the mags he's very much the type of player who um who yeah does bring me a lot of a lot of joy mainly for the wrong reasons i suppose but you know yeah. goal against the mags come on give him that well he did bring me a lot of joy once because um do you remember when sam Allardyce kept us up when we played watford last game of the season yes. um uh, he uh, after that game he was coming round and I was always that kid who wanted to take pictures with the players after the game and he came round he's just like with like my boots and I said I said yes I would like he gave he gave me his boots he's got these like little size four feet but uh, <laughs> at, the, at, the end, at the end of the day I still I still got his boots I've still got them still got them somewhere around here and at the time I had little feet as well I can't remember how old I was I was I was a tiny little kid but um, yeah I wore them I wore them for a few games they were really good. Uh, you know, well, he's a nice guy as well. Yeah, yeah, no, he 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 really was. Um, I think he's gone loan at where Crew now or something like he that. Yes, yeah, because I think he started yeah. his career there, didn't he? I, I'm, I may, may, maybe I, I'm not too sure, but yeah, I get Billy Jones talking about him. I realised actually he wasn't uh, wasn't as bad as people made him out to be. But there you go. He, he was in that championship side, like get got relegated, which is always going to taint you. Yeah. And, and he kept getting put in a back three as well, which he struggled with. Because I was even thinking, oh, he was quite all right under Allardyce, but even then he got ousted from that because he, he started playing Yedlin, didn't he? And he was in. He, he played quite a bit under Moyes, so he was there for some pretty grim times, but. You know, initially he was, he was he was broadly all right. Yeah, I guess so. But who you gone with at your uh, left back probably is a slightly better player. Would you like to tell us yeah. who it is? Uh, I, I am sort of, well, I've not played him out of position. He did play that quite a bit, but I don't think anyone's going to disagree with someone, especially of my age, having Julio Arca in their best ever Sunderland eleven. Like he was one of my, when I first started going to games, because I, like the first game I went to was in 97, but the first time I actually started getting interested was about sort of 2000, 2001. And, you know, he was this like tricky, 
like exotic like Argentinian play and like Sunderland did you know that the Peter Reid team was built on sort of like British British and Irish players mainly wasn't so having someone like him who was this like real flair player was like so exciting and you know he got goals he would take players on but I've had to crowbar him in because I've had the players I've got further up the pitch. So that's why he's in at left-back. But he did play left-back quite a bit. Um, initially, I think he was actually initially signed as a left-back, to be fair. But he, he had a good run there under under Mick McCarthy. Like when we had Stuart Downing on loan, he played there quite a bit. And that was quite a good left-hand side. So he's quite adept there. And, and actually, probably if he, if he was playing sort of now... He'd probably be quite a useful wing back because of like the, the way he plays as well. He'd probably be more possibly be more suited to that than than as a winger. Um, but he, he was just great. Oh, that free kick against Middlesbrough. Like it's it's a shame that that's the season he ended with at Sunderland because he went to Middlesbrough after the relegation. Cost you know he was pretty much our only good player. One of the few you could sort of hang your hat on then. Uh, but I just loved him as a kid. I've got like a, a signed photo of him that I've had since I was a kid. Like I've like still still got. Um, cause yeah, those are the first sort of heroes you, you don't sort of forget as a, as a football fan, don't you? Even though sometimes they're a bit more obscure. Um, and the fact he still lives in the region, like he came over here as a really young kid and, and made it his home. Like he's got a bit of Sunland in his accent as well now. That's great to hear. So yeah, he's just a. Just an all-round bit of a, a... He's like a perfect example of a Sunderland cult hero, I think, Julio. Yeah, no, yeah, completely agree. I did see that uh, free kick against Middlesbrough on um, <clears throat> Instagram. And I think it was I think it was like a, an anniversary. It was like on this day in something like that. I'm not, I'm not too sure. But yeah, it was, it was a great free kick. And uh, just, just sort of uh, remember how... like Although Middlesbrough and Sunderland obviously isn't as big as uh, Newcastle and Sunderland, but it, it's, it still was a really like massive game. And it still was a big game. And... I think, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That, was, that was that was a great moment when he scored that free kick. Yeah, because I think that game was like obviously that was the season we got relegated with fifteen points, and I think that might have even been our first win of the season in about even though it was about October or something, which is a very typical Sunderland thing to do. And I think our record at Middlesbrough was pretty terrible at the time. I'm, I'm piecing this together from memory. So the, the, there was a bit of intensity. We really needed a win. And, and Burra had like quite a good team at the time as well. Um, that must have been not long after they won the League Cup and they were playing in Europe and stuff like that. So it was it was a big win. And he in that game, he was he was excellent. He was so, so good. He just tore them apart. Um just shame we couldn't really kick on for the rest of that season, but that's not that's not who you are. This fault we won't pin that on him. Yeah, no, exactly. No, I'm sure he was a fan favourite by by a lot, and uh, yeah, he definitely deserves to be in your team. So those are your fullbacks done. Now we we'll go to your two uh, central defenders. So do you want to start us off with one of them? Yeah, central these defense. are these are a bit more erratic. I'll start I'll start with the one that I think people will agree more with, and that's Nairon Nosworthy. Again, if if you're a fan of like of around about my age. You will definitely love Nairon because he was, he was, I know he was prone to an error, but he was excellent for us in the main. Um, obviously, he came in that 15 point season mainly as a right back, didn't feature a great deal because he ended up bringing in Justin Hoyt. And I don't think he played at centre half very much. But when Roy Keane came in and started playing him at centre half, he was like a totally different player, really helped by Johnny Evans in that, in that season, playing alongside him. They were a great partnership. Um, and again, in the in the following season, when Johnny Evans came back in again on loan, they were really solid. And and that's the type of player I like, a player who is quite good. But and, and I've said it earlier, but he's also quite funny. Like when he he fell over nothing once and then just did a weird <laughs> little for, forward roll. In that Middlesbrough game, actually, when Arca scored the free kick, he tried to play a back pass to the goalkeeper and put it out for a corner. Like he got <laughs> nowhere near the keeper, so he was prone to this type of thing. But then he would also like try a Cruyff turn in his own box and would like mug off someone like like, like not Fernando Torres, but some like br- great Premier League striker. He was capable of doing those sort of things, which I guess you can't really have in your team like long term because it might eventually go wrong. But a bit like Julio Arca, he's he's a good example of someone who's a cult hero because coming coming in, um, obviously he's, he's from from London, from Brixton, I think Nosworthy. So he's got no connection to the region, but then just comes to Sunderland, totally buys into everything, gets beloved by the fans. And if you do come here and, you know, buy into it a little bit and and give everything you have and, you know, just show little flashes here and there like you did, like you will become a cult hero. And 
you know, like when he was when we won promotion under Roy Keane and he was like dancing with his top off but wearing a trilby, singing along to his own song as well. And if you have a good song as well, that'll always help. Like Huli Walker had that. Um Billy Jones even had like that funny song as well. And Darren Nosworthy always had the um the one of the tune of rehab that in Winehouse one. Yeah. Um, and yeah, he, he was great. And one of those players who doesn't he didn't really do anything after us as well. Um, I think obviously we signed him from Gillingham and I think they do hold him in similar sort of esteem. But I think well, he went to Watford. I think he featured a Portsmouth a little bit, but nowhere where he was like adored like he would be here. And when you get those rare coming togethers like that, it, it can be really sweet as well. Um, yeah, absolutely loved him. But he would have brilliant displays. I remember when we beat... Um, Aston Villa away under Roy Keane. It was quite a big game towards the end of the season. Beat them 1-0. And I think that's when Martin O'Neill must have been their manager. And they had a great team when they had like a Bongla Hall, Ashley Young, um, John Carew probably still there as well. Like great like forwards. And they were like pushing for Champions League places. And we went and beat them 1-0. And he was an absolute colossus at the back. So he was a big part in those early seasons stabilise us, stabilising us for that sort of Premier League run of, of 10 years. And, you know, you need those lads who, who work hard for you and stuff like that. But it's mainly the funny stuff like falling over nothing and doing bad back passes and putting your heart in your mouth like trying Cruyff turns in your own box. That's why he's in there. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I think Nairn was a player who completely connected with the fans. You know, like, like you said, when Roy King got us up, that uh, one beat Luton 5 0 away, and he's just there, you know, jumping in with the fans. And I, I think, yeah, you got you got to have one of one of those players you can sort of who aren't, who aren't born who, who really did connect yeah. with the fans. And I mean, what your uh, his central defensive partner always had a bit of a mistake in him. Do you know? Who <laughs> who he is as yeah, well? um, I think Santiago Virginia gets a bad rap. And the thing he will he'll always be remembered in sort of Premier League, you know, he'll always feature in those like own goals and gaff sort of DVDs now. Because that own, that own goal against Southampton was oh, astonishing. I, like, I wasn't at that game, but I remember watching uh, on like a, a dog, I was going to say not a legal street, but definitely, I don't think I'm going to get prosecuted for that now. It was no. like six years ago or something. Um, yeah, I was watching that on a stream. And when it happened, I just couldn't help but burst out laughing because it was so surprising. It's like, has, that re- has he really just done that? Has that really <laughs> just happened? But that's obviously what he'll always be remembered for. But he was quite a good player. I know he did mainly play at right back for us rather than rather than centre half, to be fair. But I remember we played a game against Chelsea. It was like a I think it was like a five thirty kickoff on a Saturday, so it was like under the lights. We drew nil nil with them and he played brilliantly. And I just remember him constantly mugging off Eden Hazard. I think he flicked the ball over his head at one point. I think he might have even nutmegged him as well, but he was like capable of these brilliant, but like Naira Nosworthy, he did have a mistake in him as well, like the own goal or, or a lapse in concentration. And it's probably like players like him who you'll see have like a run of like really like a couple of good games. And then in that third game, he will make a, an error that'll lead to, to conceding a goal. And that's why they were playing for us and not at that higher level. It is those fine margins, but it's the things like I love those sort of players as you've probably noticed by now because he was really skillful for a centre half and not really anything again like we'd had before similar to, to Julio Ark we did sort of sign no actually we, we had like the likes of John Mensah just before that who did nearly make it into my team because I loved him but he's, he's just a little bit too good um, so I went for Virginia instead but just a sort of like flair defender who would like carry the ball out like quite confidently as well. He was actually quite good on the ball as well as good at the physical side of it as well. But yeah, that that own goal was that was that was quite something. And you've got to give him that. But you know, featured in some wins over Newcastle as well. Um I was gonna say I think he played in the in the League Cup final, but I don't think he did. I think he might be in the squad. Um so you know he was left some some for some good times, wasn't he? Like relatively speaking anyway, um especially when you look at us now. Um yeah, I, I loved him. And he's one of those players who, like, Dars would fume about, similar to Nosworthy, because they would, like, try, like, daft stuff. But I'm like, no, you want that. You want a bit of that. Like, it makes it interesting. So, yeah, that's probably quite a leaky back four, but um, a, a back four of, of, of cult heroes, I think you would make an argument for. Yeah, also that Virginia own goal. I mean, I, I, it was incredible how he kicked it in his own net. But you have to ask the question, so, what actually was he trying to do? as well? <laughs> 
kicked it with his right foot. Uh, like, was he trying to kick it across the pitch? I don't even know what he was trying to do. Because but... there's no need for him to like kick it out for a corner there, was there? So he can't have no. been trying to do that. <laughs> I don't know. It, it's, it's very strange. I think you could sort of put maybe Ozturk in this the same sort of picture yeah, as these yeah. these players as well because they just try ridiculous things, just like grab, no, not even tackle someone, just grab them in the <laughs> like the the striker in the box, crazy stuff like that. But yeah, so but that's when it comes back. off or when you get away with it, it's brilliant. And and it's those players who play on that sort of like who play on that line. It's sort that sort of fine margin. Like that's what makes them great. Yeah, no, yeah, completely agree. I, I mean, uh, if you're if you're looking at trying trying to uh, uh, to win games, I'm not sure they'll be the best option. But to have a good old laugh about them, they're, they're, <laughs> they're, def- they're it's definitely, definitely going for it. well with the defense anyway. Yeah, no, that makes me that makes sense. So that's your goalkeeper and back four. Now you have gone with a, a four three three, I do believe. Yes. So you want to start us off with one of your centre midfielders? Yeah, um, I think. So it, it's a fairly defensive sort of midfield three, to be fair. So hopefully that'll give a bit of protection to that back four. Um, <laughs> one, and again, I think someone whose time at Sunderland goes a bit forgotten is Dwight York, because uh, similar to that, um, to to what I was saying about Nosworthy about that promotion season, he obviously came in as a striker. He'd been playing in Australia. Everyone thought his career was pretty much over, but. Obviously, because we had Roy Keane as manager, gave us that pull for these type of players and did play a few games attacking wise. I think I think he did initially start playing for us as a forward, but we sort of did with him what he was doing um, for Trinidad and Tobago. I think he was playing in that midfield sort of holding role for them because obviously his legs had gone, but he still had his amazing touch. He was so calm on the ball as well. The one thing. I remember a lot about Dwight York playing in midfield for us is everyone getting really nervous when like like shouting man onto him and he would just do like just a quick little turn and mug them off or he would like just release the ball at the perfect time. I just remember always thinking like if there's one player you don't need to make make aware of that as a man on, it's him, he knows, but he was just so cool and so sure of himself. But he did a really good job for us in that promotion season he was really important. I remember scoring um, away to West Brom, which was like a big promotion six pointer. But when we went up, we really needed, though, especially after we went down with 15 points, we didn't really have not just any star quality, but any sort of like confident players who'd been there and done it. We didn't have enough of that. So having someone like him, and especially playing the midfield role to have that influence on the team. It's kind of forgotten just how important that was in having that confidence, not just for the players themselves, but for the fans, really, because we'd had two record low relegations with, let's say, maybe not so much in the 19-point season, but especially in the 15-point season, some pretty abject, terrible players. And to have someone who was that confident and still that good, who you could rely on, who'd been there and done it, he was kind of like... You know, Roy Keane would stand on the touchline, or, or not even stand on the touchline, just stand in the dugout. And he was always quite calm. He never really shouted and barked. And York was like that on the pitch, just so assured. He was at, he was so good. Um, and, and again, a bit of a forgotten one, and, and that's why I've put him in. The one thing that I really liked about Dwight York as well was when we played Leicester on New Year's Day in that promotion season away, and went down with our family and we stayed over um, for some reason. I'm not sure why. But anyway, we stayed in the hotel. It was just opposite the, the King Power Stadium. And we were looking out the window after the match and the Sunderland team bus was there. So we're like, oh, the players are coming out. I'll go down and get like programme signed, pictures, everything like that. And so doing that, the players were all coming out like in their suits, like ties all done up like really well, all filing onto the bus. And then Dwight York strolled out. Shirt buttoned down pretty much to his navel, swaggering out, didn't get on the team bus. He had a private car waiting for him, got in the back seat of that, and the car just drove him off. And it's just like, oh, that is just like, I love just how yeah. cool it was. And obviously, if he's coming to Sunderland from like Sunderland himself in Australia, Roy Keane's probably going to give him like a little bit of, you know, don't worry, you don't have to like train as hard as everyone else, given his age and stuff like that. So he's obviously like giving him that bit of leeway, but. Good man management, I guess, as, as well from Keane, to be fair. But it's just how cool he was, like, swaggering out like that. And and on the pitch, he he, he was really good for us in, in that promotion season, the first two seasons or so, back up in that in that midfield role as well. Yeah, I mean, he was with us for, 
so about maybe three three years, I think it yeah. was 2006, 2009, I believe. Um, so yeah, it's not like he just came for a season, played a few games. Like he was he was a, a player, like a, an integral part of the team, really. Yeah, and uh, and yeah, and yeah, just a a, a top a, quite a, a top character as well as well as a player. Yeah. I think that's what everyone expected as well. Everyone just thought, oh, he'll just come, he'll play the odd game now and then. Maybe it's a bit of a final signing on fee for him and stuff like that. But it was the total opposite. He was a really good servant of the club in in quite an important time for us as well. The uh, other midfielders, have you got? Yeah, I've gone right. Th- this one is a, is a a quality one, which I don't think anyone will disagree with. It's obviously only with us for a season. It should heartbreakingly. It should have been. It should have been more. Jan and Via. Yeah. Um, I just okay, think, yeah. gen like in terms of quality. Obviously, people might disagree with this, but in terms of his quality, probably one of the best midfielders the club has ever had. He was astoundingly good, and like it's a bit depressing. Like when you look at like us now, and you, when you look at someone like Josh Scorn, and you're like, God, yeah. Like five years ago, we had Cannon V just making everything look effortless, but I mean, we've said it quite a few times, like a player who has probably never even heard of Sunderland before he signs for us, let's be honest, comes in and just immediately buys into us. Like, he loved playing in front of that crowd because he loved to tackle. He loved really getting stuck in. He played with such an intensity. But he had, like, such good vision as well. He was such a clever player. When he played with... Obviously, he was playing under Sam Allardyce when he had the fullbacks of Van Arnholt and DeAndre Yedlin, who would fly forward. He was so clever at tucking in and covering for them. His tackle was like, it wasn't the fact that he just liked to crunch and tackle. He would make those really clever tackles as well, where he would like come away with the ball and start a move with it really quickly as well. Um, I remember in the 3 0 win at home against Newcastle that season, he was just outstanding. So, so good. And so many other good performances that season but he loved like loved playing playing to that big crowd as well and he just became a fan favorite so quickly as well and just had so much quality and the fact that we couldn't get him in permanently and had to settle for for Diddy and Dong was was quite heartbreaking yeah. you know we wouldn't pay seven million or whatever it was and there he goes um, and as well as loads like daft off the field stories with him to be fair about he chased someone away from his house um, with an axe once in in Russia, and there's a story about him and it might even be Antoine Griezmann or, or someone else when he was when he was younger in the French setup with. They were at some training camp, and they drove. They wanted to go for a night out in Paris, even though this training camp was about hundred miles away. And he was like the ringleader for that, and they all got in like loads of trouble for it. So like a proper character as well, but quality footballer. Um, bit raj but knew how to balance it out as well and i'm quite surprised and you know there might be off the field stuff and maybe some of those attitude things are the reason why but i'm quite surprised he didn't really go on to play for sort of like champions league level clubs i always remember arsenal were rumored to be to be interested in signing him permanently when he was on loan with us um you know we looked at some of the midfielders they've had recently maybe he wouldn't have been a bad shout for them um mm. But yeah, his, his quality, I, I do remember thinking at the time, to be fair, he's one of those players, just enjoy him while he's here because he is better than us. But he didn't end up signing with us for, for different reasons. Um, his Instagram as well, when he was waiting at the airport the following yeah. summer, um, desperate to come and sign for us. And then Martin Bain just wouldn't call him and went to sign Didier and Dong instead. I remember everyone tracking flights into Newcastle Airport, thinking which one he was, he was going to be on. Um, we were all getting excited that night, but it, it wasn't a B. But that kind of adds to the mythology as well. It was this one season where he was brilliant for us. And, you know, he, I guess he didn't get the chance to sully us at all. That's uh, maybe the silver lining. He's just, again, another... I think it is a bit of an 11 of, of cult heroes, this you'd say. And he's definitely, definitely one. Yeah, yeah. Someone I think we should have definitely signed. I remember speaking to Graham Falk about it, where he he interviewed Sam Allardyce and said... If you if you if you would have stayed for the next season, would would you have just not have signed Envia? And he said never. He said Envia would have been like the first player to come back, and he doesn't understand why why they didn't bring him back. It's just it, like easy like easy decisions. I don't even think Jan Envia was it going to cost anything, or it was only going to cost a few I million. Want, I think is the the reason the club gave for not signing him was because he was at Ruben Kazan, wasn't he? And they mm. wanted seven million, but I think his contract was expiring. 
I think it was even weird. Like it was expiring in January or something like that. So, uh, so Sunderland's stance was, well, we're not going to pay seven million when we could potentially get him for nothing. Which it's just like now, like it's seven million for a midfielder that quality is nothing. Like just basic because then we went and paid like thirty million for, for Didier and Dong, and I know that was probably structured differently, but you're willing to make that financial commitment. Just pay for Yan and V, you know you would slot in. I think that was, you know, Moyes had many problems, but I think a big part of it was his arrogance in not just looking at what Sam Allardyce had assembled in terms of the the setup and the players. And not just trying to build on that. He tried to rip it up too much and put his own stamp on it. And I think if he'd had a bit more humility, it could have been quite a bit different for Moyes. But you know, he showed quite a lot why he's, why he's not that type of person. Which makes it really annoying that he's doing quite well now at West Ham and we're in League One. It just shows that we're, we're never... We're always... Yeah. Um, it's always going badly for us, and never the people that wrong us, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know. But like, no one likes David Moyes anymore, and I, don't, I think a lot of Sunderland fans, my dad included, I, I'd, I'd hear him just like sitting downstairs in the living room, and he'd be like, oh, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." And I'm like, "What? Well, Newcastle getting beat?" And he's going, "No, West Ham are getting beat." <laughs> Great. <laughs> so, so you know, yeah, yeah. I think as well, MV is sort of fit into that team because I think they're all sort of a group of friends as well. You know, yeah. like um, you know, like Kabul, Kone, and Defoe. They all fit into that just that group of group of friends and I think it was never complete you know when Kabul Kabul went we didn't get him via back had yeah. did, did a bodgy and uh did yeah and dong it just it, it just didn't work and and via was such a, a key player that uh we we missed out on um but the uh the last midfielder of the midfield three yeah well he played alongside him as, as well in that season and I, I couldn't leave him out of Lee Catamall um for I think I know he does divide opinion with with a lot of people, and I, and I can see why to an extent because he has unfortunately got, he's got associations with some poorer times at the club as well. You know the relegation of the Championship and the Premier League, failing to go up from League One. But I think that's oddly kind of a positive. He always stuck with the club, and people might say, well, he didn't have any other offers. I bet if Catamore wanted to go back to the Premier League when we were in the Championship. Someone, even a bottom six side, would have taken him on. But he cut. He's, and he's constantly spoke about the reason he stayed is because he wanted to put things right. He wanted to, you know, he came here to to help Sunderland, you know, achieve things. And even if just achieving something was getting us back out of League One, he, he really wanted to do that. And I think that's really commendable. Um, the fact that he played injured so much as well, um, which he's recently spoke about, like with his, um, I think it was hip, like hip injuries, wasn't it? He did a quite a long interview about that quite recently after after retiring um yeah the fact that he was always willing to do that and you know we speak about these players who give everything who love a tackle and, and he was very much that that i don't buy into well he just got like and it's to be fair it's not usually said by Sunderland fans it's usually said by people from outside the club that you know he gets sent off too much and he's got disciplinary problems like he didn't actually get sent off that much he just unfortunately had two that were quite close together um one of which against Wigan, I don't think was his fault because he was left one on one way. He had to make a challenge. I'll take that to my grave. Um, but he was, he had excellent seasons for us in the, you know, under Gus Poyer, he played his best football when he was in that anchor man role. Um, probably should have gone to the World Cup in 2014. He was, he was that good, and England didn't have great midfield options and and never got a look in for that reason i i really feel for him in on the england side of things because he was a, he was um quite integral to the under 21 setup when he was in that age bracket and never really got much of a look in for the senior side and i think a lot of that was quite lazy by a lot of you know by perception and stuff like that um maybe if gareth southgate had been managing then given he's he played with them at borough it um, might have been a bit different but in that 13-14 season, as, as part of that great escape, um, you know, getting us to the cup final, he was he was really important. And you could always see what it meant to Catamol as well. Like, how many pictures are, are there of him, like, G and the fans up or celebrating? That one where he's, like, strangling Seb Larson. It looks like he wants to kill him, but he's, he's celebrating Larson's score and, like, that, that level of intensity. Yeah. It's the total, like fan representation on, on the pitch thing, isn't it? And it's, it's it's very similar to Kevin Ball. I think, you know, not to, not to speak for anyone else, but I think for people who are my age, like I'm 28, so I kind of was too young to appreciate that Peter Reid sort of like golden period. I, I can't really remember it. I started getting interested in football like to the tail end of that. 
I think he's that for a lot of people, sort of like my age or maybe a touch younger. And whenever he scored, it was like an event because like he obviously didn't score for so long. He got a few in. He actually got like quite a few in that first League One season, didn't he? But like when he scored yeah. that really weird goal against Tottenham or the, the one against West Brom, the opening day of the yeah. season, I was at that game and like that was not just scenes because it was like first goal, it was quite early in the game as well, like first goal of the season. It was like the fact that Lee Catamore just pinged one in the top corner. You're going to celebrate it a little bit more, aren't yeah. you? Um, I do feel from that he didn't get more sort of like the, the, the best things he, he had at Sunderland were sort of like celebrating like survival and stuff like that. I think he did deserve more that because of his loyalty and because of his commitment and you know that's that's what we value. So if if you're a Sunderland fan who says you value things like that, I don't think you can. You know, yeah, he probably had poor games now and again, but I don't think you can ever question his his commitment to the club and and how much he he loved it here. And you know, he he, he stuck by us a lot. He was sacrificing his his body like to the extent like I was talking about playing injured. And yeah, he just like when when we beat the Mags or. Um, and he's like celebrating on the bench. I think it was um was it the one where we beat them one nils before Christmas? Yeah. And he's like yeah. jumping off the bench and and after the game he was probably leading the celebrations then. Like like I say about fan fan representation on the pitch, it is it is Lee Catamall. And if you don't if you don't like Lee Catamall, I think as a Sunland fan, I just think you're trying a bit too hard to be to be miserable, to be honest. Yeah, also when he signed as well. He, he was a great player. It sounded at the age of what, like 20, 21, something like that. Yeah, quite a yeah. young player. And he, and straight away, you know, when he when he could, he took the captain's armband because he he was that player from the very start. You know, he obviously had a, he had a lot to learn. I remember listening to him speak uh, just after his time at, at Sunderland after he left. Uh, he just said, you know, when he when he got his red cards, he found it really difficult, and he went on to like a treadmill and just started sprinting because he just yeah. thought, you know, like he. He 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 was he was a really good player, a really yeah. good player on his day as well, and also as you mentioned as well the the West the West Brom goal as well because before that he only he was at Sunderland for gosh this this thing about like maybe five five or five years yeah, or something like yeah. that he was that was his like sort of fifth season at Sunderland and he's only scored one goal so when he got the <laughs> ball on the edge of the box I was there as well and it was on the other side and we were expecting him to pass that away but he shoots. And it felt like the ball was going in the air for so long. And someone like next to me said, managed to say an entire sentence when the ball was still in the air. You see, <laughs> the, the ball like hit the back of the net. And it was, yeah, it was just, it was incredible really. And uh, yeah, I, again, like the the the, uh, the league one season, I think he scored about maybe seven, se- seven goals. Yeah. Seven goals in the season. two against Wimbledon, didn't he? Which were like quite good finishes. And um, was it home to Plymouth where he like scored at the North yeah. Stand and like side footed in the top corner? Like really yeah. like quality finishes as well. Like, and then he would yeah. celebrate them like he does it every day as well. Like, oh, just, ah, oh, I love him. I absolutely love him. I'd love him to cut now that he's coaching. I'd love him to, to come back one day. Like, I've got this like lovely sort of idyllic thing that we managed to get back up in the championship and then Catamore's the one that takes us back into the Premier League like that, yeah. that that's what I want yeah because he came down with us so he's going to get us right back up yeah again, like exactly that. so yeah, he is that... going to achieve it but not in the way that he thought he's not going to do it as a yeah. player he's going to do it as a manager no I, I, like, I like that actually I, I like that so yeah <laughs> Yeah, we'll keep we'll keep that in mind. So that is your uh, midfield done. So that's, that's quite a strong midfield to cover up for the uh, the defence. Yeah. So we'll go <laughs> go forward now to your to your front three. We'll start off with your left winger. So who have you got on the left? On the left, um, apologies, I've not written down which one I've got on the left or the right. But I think if on the Smart. left, I've gone for Steve Malbronk. Correct. Yep. Well done, me. I should have backed myself there, shouldn't I? Um, <laughs> yeah, Mal Bronk is he is my my favourite ever Sunderland player. I remember being so excited when he signed. Um, so we got him from Tottenham. He'd been at Fulham before that. He was a proper established Premier League player. And and what I've said before about the the stuff about how you know this wasn't long after that relegation with fifteen points. This obviously we signed him in two thousand and eight, so it was that second season back up. But it was. It, and Roy Keane's influence for this really can't be understated enough about how turn, turning the attitude around at the club and bringing in these quality players. And obviously the fact that we had more money helped that as well with the with Drummerville and, and, and later Ellis Shaw. But signing a player like that, it just didn't, off the back of what we'd had fairly recently, it was like, oh, we... And obviously that season didn't go particularly well. We just scraped staying up, but it felt so exciting to be like, 
God, we're bringing in Steve Marbronk, like who plays for Tottenham, who like just assists goals for fun. I know he didn't score many for us, but he was just so good. And similar to what I said about Dwight York, how he'd always have loads of time on the ball. You never had to worry about him giving it away or like shout man onto him. He would know. He'd be drawing someone in and, and would nutmeg them. Like when he nutmegged James Milner twice in the space of 10 seconds, he nutmegged him. <laughs> then James Milner ran back to him. And so he just nutmegged him again. And he would have every right to be like quite a swaggering, sort of arrogant player. But he was like quite quiet and mild mannered. And apparently off the pitch, he was um, like really private as well. Like didn't talk very much at all. And that kind of added to his mystique. A little bit as as well for me. Um, obviously, he only got one league goal for us, but that what a goal it was as well. He pinged one into the, to the top corner against Hull. Um, yeah. Again, I was I was at that game, and that's the best individual performance I've seen from a Sunderland player. I think he made we I mean, won four one. I think he made another two, and he was just outstanding for one of the goals he put like just perfectly on Cameron Jones's head. It was right in front of the away end. I was sat down. I was sat quite low for that game, and he was right in front of us. Can't remember who the whole fullback was, but he just kept twisting him and turning him. And it was like if he wanted to, he could have put the ball in earlier, but he just wanted to torture the fullback a little bit more because he could. And he would do that every week. He was just so effortless and so good. And the fact that. You know, when it all unraveled for Steve Bruce, he let him go. He let Bolo Zenden go. Obviously, he lost Jordan Henderson, which is a bit of a different thing. Like, that was always going to happen. But he could have kept those players for a little bit more, especially because we didn't really sort of adequately replace them. It was such a shame because he was just unspeakably good. Like, I know I just, I just keep saying he was just really good, but I don't think anyone would disagree with that. And Actually, no one really remembers him playing for Sunderland outside of this as well. Everyone associates, associates him with Spurs and with Fulham, but he was with us, what, for three three years, I think? I um, think so, yeah. And, and just was consistently absolutely brilliant. He was so exciting. He delivered on that. Just, And it makes you sad again to look at where we are now because when are we ever going to have a, a player of that quality again? But I just absolutely loved him. And, and as I said at the top there, he's like still my favourite ever, ever Sunderland player. Yeah, I remember when I first started to actually get into the club when I when I was old enough to really understand what was going on. One of my first memories of of Sunderland was what uh, watching the game and him coming over to take a corner and everyone going steed. Yeah, you know, yeah. really get, so that that's like one of the my first ever really memories uh being a game where w- watching that. But yeah, again, what you say, he's he was a great a great player and I think he was so underrated as well, uh especially especially at Tottenham where you know, one one of my one of my like best mates. He's a Tottenham fan, and he doesn't even know Steve my Bronk is. And I'm like, how how do you not know Steve my Bronk? But they've had so many good players. They're spoiled, aren't they? Like I make a similar yeah. argument that Jermaine Defoe is more of a legend at Sunderland than he is at Tottenham. Because even though he played for Tottenham for a while, I'm sure he scored yeah. like loads of important goals. But like now they've got like Harry Kane, and they've you know I know he's not doing so well for them now. But like Gareth Bale in his original spell. Christian Eriksen, go a bit further back and you've got the likes of Gary Lineker. Like they've had so many good players. Jermaine Defoe like kind of pales into insignificance for them. Whereas for us, even though he's with us for a shorter time, we don't have many players like that. And the, and the way he sort of bought into it as well, like crying after when he scored against Newcastle and stuff. And Mal Brank, I think, like is a similar thing. They're just spoiled for good players. So like yeah. they're, they're, I think that I think they should belong to us more than they do. <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah, completely, completely agree with you. So, yeah, Steve my Bronk, it's a great choice there. So, we'll head over to your other wing now. Who have you got on the other one? It, Mike, I think my forward line is actually quite good compared to my defence. I think quality is sort of like following up the pitch. Maybe not people might disagree with my striker, but on the other wing, um, another one of like my all-time favourites, Stefan Sessignon. Just you can't ignore how good he was for us. And mm. at the time, actually, it was similar to what I said about Amvia, just thinking just enjoy him while we've got him because he probably won't be, he'll probably go somewhere bigger, which didn't actually work out for him, which which was a shame. But I remember when we, like in the period when like Martin O'Neill had just came in, he was just unplayable. And even, even sort of after that as well, I remember when he, that goal he scored against Swansea from that impossible tight angle, like curled into the far yeah. corner. He would just do things like that all the time. He like, things that looked improbable or or that you wouldn't even, most players wouldn't even think of trying. He just did effortlessly. 
Um, his goal against Newcastle as well, because obviously that's the first goal in the sort of run of six in a row. And obviously we scored two of the great goals in that game. Kind of gets forgotten for how well placed that shot was as well. And, yep. you know, him being the first player of scoring in that run as well is like quite, quite significant. Um, but like Mal Bronk, just you never had, he always had time on the ball. You never had to worry. He was just so effortless, so like graceful, skillful, clever, his, his movements. Um, and the, the fact that he, he, I know we signed him in like a January window and, and it was quite a big sort of exciting signing, but he came in at a similar time as um, Sully Montari, who'd obviously played in the Premier League previously. Mm-hmm. And he was kind of the headline one. And Sessignon got a little, I know Montari was only on loan, but. I remember feeling at the time that Montari was like the the headline one who, who we all got excited about. And he didn't, you know, he was only on loan for a little bit, didn't really work out. But Sessignon like was just quietly always brilliant for us in, in that. And then it really sort of accelerated. Um, he just and actually just hit the ground running straight away, to be honest. I remember scoring a really nice goal on the last day of the season at West Ham. And then a season after that, he had a really good partnership with who I've who I've gone for up front, and that's kind of why I've gone for for my striker as yeah. well. But yeah, Stefan says no. I don't think that's one like Malbronk. Anyone anyone could argue with at all. Yeah, Stefan says no. What what a great player he was as well. And I think I remember listening to Phil Bartley speak, and he said one of the best players he ever played with was Stefan Sessegnon. And you can see the things that he did with the ball at his feet in training and on the pitch as well. So again, such such an underrated player. Um, uh, and yeah, I think as well for who you've gone with at striker. I remember a certain game QPR away was like Wes Brown's only yeah, ever goal yeah. for something. The three-two game, Sessegnon just bossed that game, and how how he scored that goal of just f- you know fooling Paddy Kenny just to fall on the floor and him to take the ball around him. That, that that's why he's so good as well. Like you're you're screaming at him to shoot, and he's just got such a clear idea of what he's going to do, yeah. and just yeah. taking it past the keeper, never panicking like. You know, you look a couple of weeks ago in the um it was in the Shrewsbury game, wasn't it, where Charlie White knocked the ball past the keeper. And fair enough, he couldn't he couldn't yeah. quite get on the end of it. But the fact that he like panicked and shot rather than like check and try and cut it inside or whatever, like a player like Sessignon, I know it's not like the exact same sort of style of player, but when you look at that level of quality of in, in that one example, um yeah, that QPR game, he was he was fantastic. I remember him being Really good uh, in an away game against Wigan as well. And beat them, I think it was 4 4 1, 4 0. And the game Craig Gardner scored that really nice free kick in. Um, and just, yeah, in that immediate period where, where he came in, I always picture him in that, that white sort of tomball or away kit as well. Like, do you know yeah. what I mean? There's certain players you associate with certain kits in your mind as well. And that's the one I always picture him in, in there as well for some weird reason. That and scoring against Middlesbrough in, in the FA Cup. Um, in the replay yeah. down there where he just rifled one in. It was a really tense game. Like, it was really bitty. It looked like it was going to penalties and he was just like, nah, ending this now. And, like, remember the away end going, like, nuts when he scored that. That was great. Yeah, um, yeah just played with a lot of good good memories as, of as well. Like, when did he ever really do anything bad? It's just a shame that, and actually, Paolo Di Canio selling him, like, just totally unexpectedly. Maybe there were other reasons for it, I don't know. But getting rid of him when... You know, we really needed to hold on to some quality players, and then obviously scored against us as well. I think, I think on his debut yeah. for West Brom, wasn't it? Yeah, I think um, so. Yeah. Very Sunderland thing to happen, that isn't it? Yeah. Kind of like it kind of again makes it perfect in an odd way. I get, I guess so. Yeah, well, that that's uh, that's great to hear. Completely agree with that. It's a great choice, Sessignon. So your striker, who he's going to link up with? Who have you gone with? Striker? Yeah, I think I think this will split opinion. But you know, I said at the start, I don't want to go for for too many cliched ones. But he was excellent with Stefan Sessegnon. I'll always maintain that. And he fulfills the quarter of being really funny as well, is Nicholas Bentner. What, like, he, for that, right, for that, people are going to, like, say that's terrible and people hated him. But he was really good in the season that he played for us. Like, yeah. he kind of, he was pretty much our only striker because that's some more Jan left. We only had, like, G as well. Like, obviously, got a goal against City, but we yeah. didn't really have much else going on up front around that time. And he was quality. Like, you know, we talk about like great first touch and having time on the ball. Like, I think a lot of people didn't like him because he didn't like get stuck in. He didn't like run around a lot. But you are going to have to have one or two players who don't do that. And that's fine if you don't do that, if you show a bit of quality. 
and he broadly did as well. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm sure people have some good examples of bad games, but in that QBR game that you mentioned, him and him and Sessignon played really well together. And in that Wigan game I mentioned as well, I think mm. he assisted Sessignon in that game too. And it's no coincidence that Sessignon's best run of form came when he played alongside Bentner. Because everyone complained about Bentner never being in the box and stuff like that, but he was great at running the channels, dragging defenders out. And I would always say, well, yeah, the, he's not in the box, but have you never noticed that Stefan Sessignon was getting extra time in the box? And it's because he would make those awkward little runs and he was he was really, really good foil for a, num- for a number 10 like Sessignon. But really funny as well. Like, you know, he, he stood in the tunnel, an FA Cup game once wearing a fedora. That was great. <laughs> like, how many Sunderland players could get away with that, like, over the years? Um, yeah. Obviously, the thing for, for Denmark when um, he had the Paddy Power pants on, and not as after Sunderland, but and all these daft things. He's a lord as well. He's Lord Bentner. That's objectively fantastic. He once put a picture on, I think it was either Twitter or, or Instagram, where he was totally naked apart from like his girlfriend's bikini top covering up um, you know, the area that we would need to be covered up. Um, but he did the business for us as well. And people said, oh, he was like soft and stuff like that. He played with a broken face at one point. Let's not forget yeah. that. Yeah, very good penalty against the Mags, and like that was a great penalty as well when he took that away and the and um, past past Tim Cruel. Well, I think it was Tim Cruel anyway. Yeah, um, was, yeah. He, was, he was brilliant in that game, as was Cessignon actually, until he got quite wrongfully sent off. Like if Cessignon had stayed on the pitch, we'd have probably beaten them that day. Um, and he really rose to the. He was obviously quite an arrogant player, Bentner, and in that derby game. So I think Fraser Campbell that came back to fitness and obviously like he, he got a goal when he when he just came back. He'd had those horrible injuries. I remember people wanting Campbell to start in that game. And, and there was a bit of I remember like people like being a bit fuming when it came out. Bentner was starting, but he really rose to the occasion. Quite an arrogant player. So he just totally drank in, like having like all the mags like screaming at him. Like when he stepped up for that penalty. I was just like, there's no... Similar to like when Barini was laughing at Tim Krill, I was like, there's no way he's going to miss this. And he just buried it, ran like the length of their stand, like winding them up, slid on his knees in front of them, like, come on. When, when If the score against the Mags at St. James's Park and then celebrate like that, when you've got a broken face, you've got to at least see he's shown a bit of commitment there. Even if he's doing it just for his own ego, you do need a bit of that sometimes in, in the yeah. squad as well, especially... You know, quality attacking sort of players are, are going to have a little bit of that. They can't all be that in that sort of league cat and all sort of mould, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, he was he was great for us, I think. And I wanted to go for a bit of a more obscure choice. And he just, he was funny as well. He would swagger around now and again. But, you know, it, again, it wound up the Dars. And I like the players that wind up the Dars as well. Like the genie, like Nosworthy. Like if, you know, they make them fume, you're like, oh, well, that just makes it. That, that, that will make me be so petty that I will defend them just that little bit more. <laughs> well, yeah, I think Bentner as well. He's, he's got a lot of important guys. I mean, you think the last time we beat Liverpool at home, he's the one who scored uh, in that in that season as well, the one 0 And another one, another point you made of him running down the channels. One one game I remember in particular is when we drew three three of Man City away, where we really should have won uh, yeah, he three three one. He scored that header and then he ran down the wing and then put that ball in for Larson. Yeah. And Larson made it three one. Yeah, but, I mean. But, I mean, yeah, as well the penalty against against Newcastle as well. So he, a lot of a lot of important goal goals he did score yeah, as I well. I forgot about the Liverpool one actually because it was like a really scrappy goal, wasn't it? At the at the North Stand, I totally forgot about that. But that so, Man yeah. City one, the the header he scored was brilliant. And yeah, the, the one you're on about with him putting the ball in for Larson as well that sums up how quite unselfish a lot of his play was. And he would do those clever runs, and he and he had quite a good pass on him to be fair. Um. You know, probably not one you would want to sign permanently. Best when he's coming in on loan with a bit of a point to prove, perhaps. But he, you know, I think he more than fulfilled his his, his promise to us, so to speak. And you know, when you contextualise it as well, Asamoah Jan left at the very last minute. We'd lost Darren Bent earlier in that year. We did need someone to step up a little bit, and and I think I think Bentner, to his to his credit did that um but he was, he was never going to stick around for more than a year. But maybe again, like in Villa, that's probably for the best. Keeps the mythology yeah. around them. I, I guess so, yeah. So that's your uh, starting eleven. Uh, that's going along the bottom now. So 
To be honest with you, that's that's quite a, an interesting back four. But <laughs> I mean, yeah, you, you have to you have to say. I mean, when we when we speak about these players, you do realize what they've actually done in the past, and it hasn't been too bad. So this is your team. If you had to have a manager to manage this team, who would you have? I feel like actually, because I've spoken about him so much, I should go for Roy Keane, but it's not going to be, and I'm not going to be cliche. So it's not going to be Peter Reid either. And again, I'm going for someone who I just find quite funny, and that's Chris Coleman. And yeah. it's mainly for the for the uh, Sun until I die reasons, you know, when he swerves the Christmas party and like gets really excited over Fred Oz, that is just hilarious. Like I think about that far more than you would expect. I think about that and when he gets when he gets called a prick and says, I'm not you call me a prick, I'm a married man with six kids. That is the weirdest <laughs> response to getting an info <laughs> ever. And it's just what what was the thought process there? Like I've I've seen people suggest, did you think did he get mixed up with someone called the wanker and perhaps he said that? Or is it sort of a, I'm a man of honour sort of thing? Like, I'm a married man, Maybe. I've got six kids. Like, it's quite a good comeback, to be fair, because if someone's having a go at you and potentially going to hit you, it's going to come, potentially going to go, wait, what? And then you're going to be able to, like, get the upper hand on them, maybe. Yeah. Um, but as well, like, on the more, like, non-hilarious side of it, when he came in, obviously it was after Simon Grace and David Moyes, who were who were quite dour characters. And when he were, when he was appointed, it was a massive coup, like off the back of what he'd done for Wales. It was all yeah. like, no, well, I don't think he was expected to leave Wales just yet. Or when he did, he was probably, you know, why would you go to a side struggling against relegation in the championship? I follow quite a few, like a couple of people who, who were Welsh football fans, and I remember them tweeting at the time, like, all the best, Chris, it's been amazing. But are you insane going to Sunderland was kind of the vibe. And when he came, so for a start, I was like, well, this is someone with good pedigree, obviously done a decent job at Fulham as well, like a few years previous. But then in the, I remember in his first interview, it was a bit cliche, but you felt like this is what we need a bit more of. We, we've had these two dour characters who don't really have much gravitas, but he is someone coming in and kind of does understand the club straight away. Now, obviously, We've learned since that what he was saying and made it didn't really marry what was going on behind the scenes. But what I wonder with Coleman is, was it maybe a bit of a right man at the wrong time? Because he did yeah. did such a good job at Wales. He took the Wales job in far more difficult circumstances than, than the Sunderland job because he, he took it off he took the job um, off the back of, um, of Gary Speed passing away. So him coming in as well to to try and do. I don't want to say a similar job, but I think you take my point in that. Like he is, he, a lot needs to be done here. There's there's a lot of problems at this club, and him taking the chance to do that, I, I do admire that quite a bit because he could have gone somewhere a bit more comfortable, but he wanted to come to a big club, and yeah, there's a bit of arrogance with that. But again, he he did buy into it, and he and he moved his family up here, and obviously, I'm not pretending he did a good job because he, he didn't, and you know he persisted with a back three for too long, but. I just like him as a bloke, and I yeah. what, and I and I do wonder if I think he is someone who might have been a good fit in a in a slightly more stable time. But I will be honest: the main reason I've gone for him is because he is really funny. He loves a drink, apparently, as well. There's that story when he was at um, Real Sociedad, and he said he was going to be late for training because his washing machine had broke, and it turns out he'd actually been out the night before to student night. Which is just absolutely fantastic. Um, you know, he went to China as well afterwards, so that kind of like makes you think. You know, was he sort of like phoning it in after you know with us as well and stuff that like you know Aidan McGeady's spoken about quite a bit, hasn't he? That he wasn't really walking the walk as much as he was talking the talk. But the Fred O's thing, man, I love that Fred O. <laughs> it's so so funny. Like I like, I think your manager does have to be maybe now and again a bit of a meme. As well, yeah. I, I do. I do quite like that. And uh, Coleman did give us some some mean potential. And you know, I can see him getting along well. Obviously, managed Catamore, but some of the other lads, I can see him like getting along like with Nicholas Bentner. I'd see them going out on the town together. I'd see them in the Cooper Rows at one a.m. on a Saturday night, <laughs> tearing yeah. it up. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. Now you've said that, I can actually see that in my head. Really, yeah, Co Coleman. Yeah, I, he was he was a, he was a great guy. Don't get me wrong, he was a great guy. And I think when he when he came into the club, there was it was a losing mentality. Obviously, we just 
Simon Grayson was sacked and it was a losing dressing room and he can never seem to get the team up for it. You know, we I remember we, we beat Fulham around sort of Christmas time. We thought is the turning point now. And then I think we got, we got, I don't know, we got beat the other, the next week or something like that. I can't remember. Yeah. And then we also won against Nottingham. There was really weird like times where we would win games, like beat Nottingham Forest away 1-0. I, I was at that match. I remember it was a great, it was a great game to be honest. We, we remember Darren Gibson just bossing the whole game. That's what yeah. I remember from that. He did have an odd good run, didn't he, Gibson? Like under Coleman, yeah. which was weird. And then obviously that ended quite badly. But I was at his second game in charge, and his first win um, when we beat Burton 2 0. Yeah. And like it did feel like, like when he was on the pitch after and he was like celebrating with the fans, it, you did feel a little bit of belief again, especially after the two managers we'd had who didn't, who weren't good fits. And I think that's like, fine now and again for clubs to just think the manager isn't a good fit. Do you know what I mean? I think, and, and I don't mean that in an arrogant way of like, well, West Ham are a good example of you have to play the West Ham way. I don't mean in terms of style of football, but I think you do have to understand or be able to identify with the fans. And for everything Coleman did wrong, he did get that side. And sometimes that isn't easy, especially at a club with a massive fan base like us. He did make that initial connection and everyone did buy into him. And actually, even at the end of the season, no one was expecting him to be sacked. The, the general sort of vibe, I'm, I'm sure there's people who disagree, but I think a lot of people were, well, it's really unstable at the minute. If we can get taken over, he, he's stuck by us. He's put in everything, well, kind of put in everything he could. He deserves to have a go at taking us up out of League One. And it, and it was quite a shock when he when he did get sacked. Um, yeah. So, yeah, maybe, you know, uh, the the wrong, right, potentially the right man at the wrong time. So, with this qu- the much better squad rather than our 17 18 relegation from Championship season, maybe he could do, maybe he could do a better job with this loss. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I think he needed that time really to have the summer and so he could build his team that he wanted. You know, when you have a January window and the the owner's saying that you can't spend any money or whatever, it's really difficult, I think. So if he had that time to really build his own team, and same way, I was I wasn't I was uh, really surprised when he was sacked really because it was like we haven't actually got to see what he's made of yet, yeah. you know. And and I think I think I think we did miss out on that. Yeah, it was a shame. It was a shame for him. But yeah. I, I, think people, I think people are definitely going to, you know, if they haven't already disagreed with a lot of this team, they are definitely going to disagree with that choice of manager because they are there are better Sunderland managers over, you know, the past sort of like 20 years or whenever when I'm sort of basing this on. But, you know, you've got to go for the, you can't go for the boring choice. It'd be boring if I said like, like Steve Bruce got us finished 10th, but one, he's managing the mags now. And two, like, it's boring to go for Steve Bruce. Yeah, it? I know. Yeah, well, yeah Steve exactly. Bruce, exactly. Well, exactly. Meme, actually, I will give him that. <laughs> yeah exactly well yes that, that, that that's about it really you've gone through your whole team and the manager and and yeah i've, I've really enjoyed it. we've gone out for about an hour an hour and 12 minutes to talk talking about it and yeah it's just just reminds you really what uh some some interesting players that we've had some funny players <laughs> that we've had f- funny managers as well um yeah let's see if, any, if anyone can come up with a this is probably the worst let's be fair this is probably the worst team you've had so far so anyone else, I think you've got to give them a challenge to see if they can come up with a worse team, but with yeah. enough quality in it as well. You can't just like pick the worst players you've ever had. That's too easy. You've got to go worse, but with a bit of quality as well. There's a challenge for, for one of your next guests. Thing is, the name of the series is My Sunderland Eleven. It isn't the best Sunderland Eleven, and it isn't and it isn't the worst. It's your it's your eleven. So <laughs> it's com- it's completely your choice. That's that's all the series is. Doesn't matter whether it's the worst or the best. It's Definitely. your eleven. So yeah, as always, uh, in association with the Sunderland Food Bank, uh, all details and how you can donate are in the description below. <clears throat> Thank you very much uh, from uh, for. Rory Fowler for joining me on the Wiseman Say podcast. Leave all the podcast links uh, in the description below. Do listen. It's a fantastic podcast. Um, but yes, yeah, so we'll see you all in the uh, in the next video. How are the lads?